I'm the research lead at The Graph. Um, today I'm going to be talking about ending planned obsolescence in tech. Uh, one, one thing that I find when I'm you know, meeting people at these conferences and meetups is that everyone kind of has their own vision for what makes blockchain and uh, decentralization exciting. Uh, and, if, and for me, what really captured my imagination for the first time was this quote from the original Ethereum.org website, this idea of building unstoppable applications. Uh, and it's fascinating me because this is not something that we're used to thinking about in the real world, right? Like this is kind of the, the stuff of uh, fantasy, right? Like some mythical sword, you know, that you read about that, you know, lasts forever. Um, but in the, in the physical world, we deal with the second law of thermodynamics, right? That entropy is always increasing, and we kind of come to expect that physical products will, you know, fail and degrade uh, over time. Um, but it actually uh, put to you that we do have some products today that, that last forever. Uh, and specifically, they're information products. So things like uh, books, uh, music, movies, um, and not in their physical form, right? Because like pages on the book will, will degrade, but in their, in their pure essence, you know, these things are just information. And information doesn't have any intrinsic expiration date, right? Like maybe the hard drive that something's on will, will fail, but you know, the information itself, you know, just requires a you know, medium to be played through. Um, but really it should last forever. Now another type of information product that we have that uh, we don't come to expect this property from is software, right? But software really is, at its essence, still just information. So, you know, why is it that the apps that we love and the apps that we use all the time, we've kind of just come to accept that these things fail, right? When these things are, you know, at their core, just information. You know, I would contend that, um, you know, software is just like music, except that like the boombox that you play it through is just way more complex. Uh, and we haven't figured out how to uh, give it the same properties. And so I think you can trace this all the way back to the Great Depression. Um, this is when the idea of planned obsolescence was uh, first produced. And at the time it was seen as this like breakthrough in like economic thinking, right? People were kind of desperate. There was this sense that um, the economy was failing because there wasn't enough purchasing power in consumers' hands. Um, this is the same time that John Maynard King said that it would be better to bury a bunch of money in glass jars to drive employment than do nothing. Um, and I think this idea has actually stuck with us and has become part of the zeitgeist of you know, what we expect from consumer products uh, over the last century. Um, so shortly after th those ideas were put to the test, um, a cartel of uh, light bulb manufacturers were realizing that the light bulbs they were producing were lasting way too long. And so they formed a cartel called the Phoebus Cartel, where they decided to collectively limit the amount of uh, hours that any given light bulb would uh, be designed to last. Um, so on the right, this is actually a picture of what's called the Centennial Light Bulb. This is a, a light bulb built before that era that's still burning in a uh, fire station in Livermore, California uh, today. So it kind of gives you a sense of like what these products could have been like. Um, there's a bunch of forms of planned obsolescence. Um, uh, today I'm going to be mainly focusing on contrived durability. I think this is the one that we uh, tend to identify with the most uh, with that term. Um, but it's not one that we tend to identify with software products. So let me explain what I mean when I say uh, contrived durability for, for software. Uh, and specifically it's that the apps that we use aren't designed to outlive uh, the companies that built them. And this wouldn't have been a problem maybe 100 years ago, you know, when the average lifespan of a company was, uh, you know, closer to 60 years, at least on the S&P. You know, today it's closer to 20 years, and it's projected to keep decreasing. So we need to accept that it's a reality that companies are going to last, you know, less and less time, and we need to start thinking about uh, what that means for the products that they create. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons for this, you know. There's, these are just like a couple ones that you see a lot. Uh, which is that for a long time the playbook has kind of been go big or go home for you know especially consumer applications, right? Like even big you know success stories like Instagram or Snapchat didn't even start thinking about monetization until years into their growth plan, um, and those are kind of the success stories. But many many companies fall far short of that, and they get you know maybe tens of thousands of users, and they decide that's not enough scale to, to drive a business off of, and so they shut down or they become strategic acquisitions for like large conglomerates that then 
shut them down or try and you know, migrate their users onto other products. Um, so I'm going to that this is a form of planned obsolescence because uh, these businesses are basically planning for this, this world where like, only in the case of like, massive success uh, will their users be, be taken care of rather than planning for their products to outlive you know, the companies themselves. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that we should care about this, and so I'd like to you know, kind of build some empathy for you know, the people that, uh, you know, that are affected by this, which I, I would contend is everyone in this room. Um, so I have you know, a few teammates you know, here. Just, <laughs> just this year, a couple products that we used and, and relied upon were kind of shut down against our will. Um, one of them was our project management app. You know, we had spent hundreds of hours in tweaking it, tuning it, putting our data into it. We were happy to pay for it. Um, and, and that was shut down, right? So that you're talking, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of engineers' time that, you know, is kind of stolen from us um, against our will. Uh, you can go to uh, this website that I like, killedbygoogle.com, and you can see like 150 plus projects that they've killed over the years. Um, and so I just want you to think about the users that kind of gave those products a shot, you know, spent their time getting excited about it, playing with it. Um, and then, you know, we're later also punished for kind of taking that chance. And think about what that does to user psychology, right? Like, we want startups to be successful, but if we train users that, you know, taking a risk on a new, like, startup project is, you know, a fool's errand, then, like, we're going to see a lot less innovation and adoption of new, uh, new projects. Uh, another dimension to this is tech, uh, technological stagnation. So this is something that Peter Thiel talks about a lot. Uh, he says that we have a lot of innovation in the world of uh, bits, but not atoms. Um, and I would argue one uh, part of this is that we're, we're redoing the same work over and over again. So if we go back to that list I was showing before, uh, one of these products, one on the left, that's highlighted is Mailbox. It was this kind of innovative you know, mail app that came up with this you know, nice set of uh, UX, you know, features. Uh, it was acquired by Dropbox and shut down. Then Inbox came around later, basically just copied the exact same set of features. And then so I switched to that, and then that was shut down. And you know, I'm sure there's, you know, in a year or two, we're going to find another startup that says, hey, you know, those two apps are really great. Like, let's rebuild these, you know, same features. Uh, and so, you know, I would argue that if in 10 years from now we're still talking about the latest like calendar app, to-do list app, mail app then like, we haven't done our job uh, correctly. So a common denominator that you'll see with a lot of uh, products that are designed to be obsolete is uh, what I call bundling. And specifically bundling of uh, parts that have different levels of uh, durability properties. So it's very common to see you know, parts that have really strong durability properties, the, you know, the greatest being information, which is you know, infinitely durable, with you know, parts that are more brittle. Um, so you see this across the board when it comes to uh, planned obsolescence. So you see it with physical components. Um, so like LED lights, for example, uh, there was a study that showed that like, for outdoor LED bulbs, in only 10% of like, catastrophic failures was the LED bulb itself responsible. And then the other 90%, it was either the power supply or some other you know, parts that were kind of bundled into the LED bulb. But they don't design these things to be like swapped out, um, uh, you know, atomically, and so we're just you know throwing working LED bulbs in the trash and buying new ones, you know, every so often. Uh, you see this with the latest edition of MacBook Pros, right? People were very upset that uh, they soldered and glued the uh, the RAM battery onto the motherboard, meaning that if one of these parts fails, now you're swapping out your entire motherboard instead of replacing one of these things piecemeal. Uh, we kind of talked already about information and physical media, right? So if we were still in the world where we were printing all our uh, books on, you know, only pen or paper and, uh, you know, binding, then like we would still be in a world where books were designed to fail, right? Less intuitive is information and resources. So a lot of people don't realize, you know, we don't think about what happens when we navigate to a, uh, a web page. You know, we put the URL in the, uh, in the you know, the browser, text input field, uh, but really what that thing is doing is it's mapping to an IP address through DNS. So like if you're going to like Wikipedia, for example, it's going to, you know, you're going to go to your DNS provider, you're going to get the IP address. And what that IP address really represents is a physical location on the network. So 
Um, so we're taking this thing that's just information, Wikipedia, and we're tying it to this physical spot on the network. And if that location fails, uh, then the information is gone. Uh, we see that all the time, by the way. It's called link rot, uh, if you want to look it up. Um, when we get into the realm of like software, like web apps, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So we're bundling software with the compute, storage, and other services required to make that software work. And not only that, we're also bundling those uh, compute storage resources to specific business and economic entities, right? Through these kind of complex like uh, value chains. So if you're using you know many applications today, like Facebook, you know you might have the end user. Um, watching ads, that's the monetization strategy that kind of indirectly goes to, uh, you know, then goes to Facebook, and then Facebook reroutes that value to its, uh, you know, compute and storage resources to, to keep that product or service running. And so we're in this world today where if the business stops, you know, working and stops paying for those resources, then everything stops working. And that's kind of what I want to focus on uh, today. But to give you an analogy, this would be like if when you bought a, a television, uh, from like a company, you were also like buying the electricity to run that television from that company. Like that's that's kind of the world that we're in today with with software. So the answer to this, I would argue, is full stack decentralization, and this is what a lot of us in this space are working towards. Uh, and right now, we're kind of just at the bottom of the stack, right? Uh, you know, the networking layer of the stack is what we've come to think of as operating like a utility which is to say that the value flows that keep the network running aren't directly tied to the businesses that run applications on that network, right? You pay for your internet service based on like your metered usage of that service. And in the future, that's how we think every part of the application stack uh, should work. Um, so I'm gonna focus on two major parts of this. Um, the one is data and storage, which we saw in the previous slide. Um, so instead of having web pages like Wikipedia be tied to specific locations on the network, like a physical box, we can address these things by the information that they contain. Um, so this is called content addressing. And then you can use that content address to go to a decentralized network of node operators and say like, hey, who has this piece of information? But no longer have we bundled the information with a specific location where you could find that information. With services, it becomes a little bit uh, more involved. Not only now do we want to uh, decouple the uh, information from the physical location, we also want to decouple the value flows. So what I'm showing in this diagram is that you know, the developer uh, who builds the application deploys the logic to this decentralized network of service providers, but then the value flows that keep that uh, service running are direct between the end user and, uh, and the network, right? So if this developer you know, wants to walk away, wants to work on something else, you know, goes out of business, um, this piece of infrastructure continues to operate. Um, so this is how Ethereum works, right? Like, you know, the developer submit, you know, deploys a smart contract, um, but you, unless there's some weird logic built into it, you wouldn't expect it to stop working. You know, once that developer walks away, it kind of becomes public infrastructure. Uh, this is how layer two service protocols like the graph or live peer work, um, where you know for us you deploy a subgraph to the graph, which defines your you know the query and indexing layer for your application. But once that's deployed, it's these value flows between the graph and the end user that keep that um, piece of infrastructure working. So the goal here is full stack decentralization, right? And this is what we're going to see over the next few years, is that for every piece of the stack, we're going to see an equivalent service network, either at the base layer or layer two, layer three, that kind of adopts these properties, where really the only thing that's a product is this very top level thing, you know, the, like the front end application. And everything below that is kind of based on like the metered usage of, uh, of the end user. So this is part of a long path that we've been on for, for some time. This isn't something that started with decentralization. So we've talked before about um, uh, the physical media and information. So that kind of started with the, you know, the advent of you know, digital computing. Uh, ben Thompson runs this popular tech and business blog, uh, Stratechery, where he talks about aggregation theory and how the internet unbundled um, products 
products from distribution channels and all the ways in which that you know, changed our economy. And we can kind of think of this as being like the logical next step to aggregation theory, where now we've not only unbundled you know, products from distribution, but we've also unbundled um, you know, information and software from the compute and storage resources required to operate it. And the end game here is so, in addition to getting stop unstoppable products, we move towards an economy that starts recognizing uh, the time and you know labor that uh, time and data and labor that we put into our uh, the products that we use. I guess as labor, right? So you know these things have value that we confer to it by virtue of the fact that we used it. Um, and so we shouldn't accept the world in which the businesses that we um, you know buy software from have the power to steal that labor from us arbitrarily. Uh, I think this is going to lead to unlocking uh, a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship, not just because consumers will be more uh, amenable to trying out new products with the knowledge that these things won't fail if the, if the startup fails, uh, but also because, you know, going back to that, uh, you know, full stack slide, uh, there's going to be so much more shared, uh, shared like infrastructure for new developers and new businesses to build on, right? Like imagine if today, a developer wanting to build an internet application also had to rewrite TCP and like the rest of the networking stack, right? Like think of how much less innovation we would get, but that's what we're doing with the rest of the application stack today, right? Um, the other thing that we're doing here is we're unbundling uh, ideas and labor from corporations. So this is going to change uh, the nature of work. Um, and so I think it's actually going to change work to, to be much more like the work that we see done on other information products, right? So like the way movies get you know, built, for example, you kind of you know, have an idea, you assemble a team, there's kind of many you know, contractors or you know, consultants involved, and that team gets together to like build this information product, and then it's done, right? Like we wouldn't expect you know, the team that built like Jurassic Park, for example, to stick around for 20 years as a corporation that like monetizes and extracts value from Jurassic Park. You know, instead we have studios that you know come together and build you know many different information products. Um, and the other thing I think we're going to see here is that as the amount of um, shared infrastructure uh, grows, we're going to see building software as much more of a small business activity. Right? We're going to reduce the, the barrier to entry to building uh, useful and niche applications that maybe wouldn't have worked in a world where you had this you know you had to rebuild entire parts of the stack just to build something new and useful. Um, and kind of as a closing thought, you know, the reason I want to talk about this today is just that I think we tend to get caught up a lot on the idealism uh, of Web3, and like I think that tends sometimes that like, creates a disconnect between uh, you know people in this space that are really excited and like when we try and talk about you know Web3 and blockchain to people out in the real world. Um, but I think this is something that's really tangible and concrete that we can all rally behind, right? Like everyone's used a product or spent time on a product that's failed. Um, and I think the solutions to this are, you know, becoming very real today. And so this is something that, um, yeah, that I'd like to see, you know, spoken of more as part of the promise of blockchain and Web3. Thank you.